So, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Alden Library, and welcome to this edition of Authors at Alden. Uh, tonight, we are very proud to host Dr. Samuel Crow. Um, Dr. Crow, a Ping Institute founding fellow and trustee professor of English literature, will discuss his latest book, Screen, Apta Screen Adaptations, Shakespeare's Hamlet, the relationship between text and film. Little Professor's Book Center is right over there selling copies of his book uh, this afternoon, so I encourage you to pick up a copy. The twice distinguished university professor is the author of numerous essays, articles, reviews, interviews, and books about Shakespeare in performance, including Shakespeare at the Cineplex, the Kenneth Branagh era. His expertise has taken him on lecture tours everywhere from the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. to the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-upon-Avon. Shakespeare's language in action has been a source of enchantment for Crowell since his early teens. After an education with prominent Shakespeare professors at Hamilton College and at Indiana University, he began his Ohio University career in the 1970s, teaching courses about Shakespeare on film. He followed his interest and connected with other like-minded scholars and soon rode, rose to prominence in the field of Shakespearean film studies. His book, part of which was written in Alden Library, draws upon new behind-the-scenes material from the British Library's Laurence Olivier papers and it is the first to make use of the papers of Olivier's Hamlet film editor, Helga Cranston. Facilitating this afternoon's conversation with Professor Crow is Lorraine Wachna. Ms. Wachna is a librarian in Alden Library and is the subject specialist for English language and literature. So please join me in giving a big hand to Professor Crow and Ms. Wachna. <laughs> okay. Well, whoa. I have my very own copy, and I do want to say I would highly encourage people to get this book. It's amazing. Look, look. I don't do that. Okay? So, this, and if you stay here after and buy the book, you can get it signed. Okay. So, Dr. Crowell, this is an honor for me. The book is amazing, and Hamlet is an amazing character, and I, I want to hear you talk more about it. So, so I'm curious how, when you started teaching Shakespeare on film at Ohio University, were you a pioneer? Uh, yeah. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, Dean of Library Scott Seaman uh, for this whole idea. I mean, it's what a wonderful idea that the library should celebrate authors and books, and for those of us who grew up in the book culture before the digital age and still love them and still write them and hope that there are people who still buy them and read them. Uh, this is a nice way of, of putting the library in the flow, not just as a, a receptacle for books, but as someone who also prizes them and wants to share them with a broader public. So thank Scott and, and thank Lorraine for um, inviting me and doing all this. Yeah, when I came here in 1970 and first began teaching Shakespeare, I realized that most of my undergraduates had never seen Shakespeare. They had no idea what that language looked like or sounded like when it got up off the page and into the voices and bodies of actors, where it suddenly makes sense if you, if, if you uh, uh, are someone who is uh, alert to suddenly discovering that this is real conversation going on between real people. It just happens to be poetically rich and lively, and that's why people keep wanting to say those words. Uh, actors are, save Shakespeare every bit as much as those of us who work in the classroom save him. So uh, it wasn't going to be possible for me to take uh, 60 or 70 students that I uh, taught every term, every, uh, you know, turn around and take them to Stratford in Ontario or get them to London, though we, Susan and I eventually did that. Um, so I began to think, what about Shakespeare films? And I had seen some when I was uh, younger and a few in college. Uh, but they hadn't really um, lodged in my um, memory except for a couple that were uh, obvious in their interest. Uh, and, and it was also the case that even good Shakespeare professors that I'd had in college and in graduate school 
who loved Shakespeare in performance, which was not, this was the age of the new criticism when it was the text and text based, was not always the case. They had very poor opinion of the Shakespeare film. I mean, mention Orson Welles and uh, you did not get a very happy response. Um, anyway, so I began, I got a little grant from University College. There was something called the Experimental Education Fund. And uh, uh, began looking around to see if these films were available, and they were in 16 millimeter. Remember, you youngsters out there, there were no videotape, there were no DVD. This was still something you put through a projector. Um, and so I discovered uh, from various little film outfits that you could put together a, a group of about 10 Shakespeare films. And I thought maybe what I ought to do, rather than just bringing them into a Shakespeare class, is to teach them all at once. And I'll do an experimental course called Shakespeare on Film. And it happened to work out brilliantly because we, we have a good film program here, but it's all graduate work. And in those days, there weren't even undergraduate courses in the history and, uh, and theory of film. Uh, the, there, were, there was just graduate students, and they were appointed professionally. They were being taught how to make films, how to be editors, how to be sound people. And a couple of them came to see me and said, we see there's a film course. We want to take every film course we can find. Can we uh, take your course? I said, sure. We'll find a way to give you a graduate number for it. And they were terrific. Because as I tried to uh, work with the films in terms of making the Shakespeare work for my kids, they made film work for the rest of us. And they were brilliant in showing us the difference between a film made, let's say, by Laurence Olivier and by Orson Welles, and why maybe we ought to prize the latter every bit as much as we naturally prized the former. So it was a wonderful sort of experience of a class and a professor all teaching one another. And that led then to uh, some other classes. I got a university professorship, so naturally one of the things I said I'd teach was Shakespeare on film, and then that's when Susan and I took our first group uh, to London to begin to see um, Shakespeare on the stage there. I just want to make one more point that about this time, A, I discovered that these films were better than people had thought they were. Lucky for a young guy, nobody had talked about them. There hadn't been a lot of stuff going. So, and that was always the problem with a Shakespearean. God, the library was filled with 400 years of somebody, you know, talking about Shakespeare. So here I had fresh material. And I wrote a couple little essays based on some things I'd seen in these films and sent them off to professional meetings. And lo and behold, there were other young people like myself who were doing the same thing. And we sort of got on, we, got, we became part of the carnival of professional Shakespearean meetings in that we would go and make outrageous claims for these films to uh, audiences that were stunned when we would say, oh yeah, Wells's Macbeth is much better than Shakespeare's. I mean, we were just putting them on, but it turned out we drew an audience. And so they asked back, oh, we gotta do more film. Now, Shakespeare and film is such a major part of Shakespeare studies that I, I'd almost like to blow it up, okay? That, that always happens. So it was great for me, turned out professionally, that I suddenly found an area that I could write about, and that's why um, my books are text-based as well as film-based. I'm trying to bring film to the, to the literature student, but I also don't want to give away that text, which is what I first uh, fell in love with with Shakespeare. So long roundabout <laughs> answer, but that's how Shakespeare and film came to Ohio University. And so it really wasn't something that people were exploring that much yet from nothing. what you're saying? Absolutely nothing. There, were, there was maybe one book that had been written in the um, early 70s by a woman who was one of the leaders of this group, Bernice Kleeman, on, on Hamlet. And then 19, the first really solid book on Shakespeare and film is 1977, published interestingly by the Indiana University Press. And uh, that's, the, that's the first, that's the founding text, uh, Jack Jorgens' Shakespeare on film. So that's, it, that's when it started. You know, it was interesting. I just want to share with the people that do research here and that are students that I had asked Dr. Carl, so what databases do you use at the library? And he, he doesn't really need to because he is a database. So, but all that research you've done in your past all culminates to you being this sort of authority and expert on Shakespeare and film, and I just wanted to put that out there. So um, let's see. Did you also like to, were you interested in showing other authors on film or did you stick stri strictly with Shakespeare? No Austin, Dickens. Um. Dean McWilliams and I did develop a little course in literature and film that I only taught once. I mean, it was, it was his baby, and I said I'd help him work with it, and uh, we taught it um, 
in a big lecture class, and um, and I did it once and only did one Shakespeare film in it and did things. Mm, uh, and Austin is a good example, but we did things all the way from Austin to Paths of Glory to um, uh, a Raymond Chandler of The Big Sleep. Um, anyway, a, a variety of kinds of when I taught it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but no, my baby was Shakespeare, and, and, but not being embarrassed when Shakespeare touches base with film as popular culture. Because Shakespeare was popular culture. It's just that over the years, he got taken over by the high and mighty. And the notion in theater is not something that is available to everybody. Now it's very expensive. And film is, our, is, the, is the medium that most of us um, incorporate into our lives without thinking about something that we're, that we're doing that's um, uh, culturally important. Uh, and so I love it when. Um, Shakespeare and film, uh, and, and popular film, touch base when genres sort of mix, or when a filmmaker reaches out to see how a particular film genre would work to maybe open up a particular Shakespearean text. I, I think that's when the Shakespearean film area is at its richest. There's a, there's a phrase in ornithology uh, called the abrupt edge. And it's where one sort of terrain comes up and abruptly meets another. And usually there's um, uh, a, a path of terrain between the two that's dense. Think of um, uh, a meadow coming up to a riverbank. And the riverbank is lined with trees and undergrowth and stuff. And that's where the birds are. That's where the good stuff is. It's in that edge between the two. And when Shakespeare and popular culture meet and meet uh, in an exciting fashion, it's that edge that I find particularly um, interesting. So um, it's interesting, too, because actually I've been doing a lot of Shakespeare research for other reasons. And it just hit me how much Shakespeare is about language and how films can really make it pop, because it is about he He wrote things to be performed. So film is a beautiful medium for that. And what's beautiful about this book is that Dr. Kral compares uh, Laurence Olivier's Hamlet with Kenneth Branagh's Hamlet. And he breaks down what makes them two different films. And I just want you to talk about that. I, I mean, I could ply you full of questions, but just in terms of um, why, why did you choose them? And then go from there. OK. <laughs> uh, maybe I should uh, back up just a little bit and say that this series is a part that, that my book is in, is a series called Screen Adaptations. And it's not limited to plays into films or Shakespeare into film. One of the really good um, books in the series is on To Kill a Mockingbird, another one on Pride and Prejudice, uh, another one on The Great Gatsby. Uh, but it's what it, what it attempts to do is to bring an understanding of film to students who are watching these texts in class as, um, I don't know, not a substitute for reading the text, but as sort of an, uh, a cupcake for having done so. I don't think there's a lot of discussion that goes on. We read the text and then we see the film and wasn't that nice and yeah, we liked the film or we didn't or we thought that actor was bad. There's no, no attempt to understand what the grammar and rhetoric of film are and what, uh, how a filmmaker goes about making an independent work of art. So that's what this series is meant to, con to confront. And of course, Hamlet, there are so many examples that I wanted to concentrate on two that seemed to me to be wonderfully uh, and starkly different, and also wonderfully and starkly related to the moments when they were made. Because I like context, too. I am an old new critic where just give me the text and the words. But I think it's not a bad idea to know something about the moment in which the text was conceived. I, don't even, I think it's not a bad idea because we're curious about if there's anything going on in the artist's life at the moment that the text was conceived that we may see him or her maybe working out in the text. So anyway, these were two wonderful examples of that. Olivier's film cuts all of the um, political framework of the play. There's no Fortinbras. There's no even Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. He was really radical doing that. And I think that's why Tom Stoppard wrote Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. I think he said, by God, I'm going to make them the heroes of my play. If Olivier is <laughs> going to cut him out of his film, I'm going to bring those guys center stage. They're still going to be clueless. They're not going to know what's going on. But nevertheless, I'm going, to, I'm going to make them, when we hear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, that line, in the theater, 
maybe Shelley and Dennis, but most of us don't blink an eye. It isn't, oh, my God, are they really one of them? It's terrible that they're gone. No. Man, we're racing to the end of Hamlet. He's, he's dead. Their bodies littered all over, and these are two more, you know, those fraternity boys that came and, and uh, were disloyal to their pal. Anyway, boy, at the end of Stoppard's play, you care about those two, you know? Anyway, so um, Olivier uh, comes at a moment after the Second World War, after a tough time when the world is turning inward, when Freud is suddenly uh, someone that is being talked about far more than Marx, um, that, uh, that even in our own internal uh, political world, it's, um, it's the enemy within, it's communism within, it's the Un-American Activities Committee and all of that. And Olivier gives us a very internalized Hamlet. Of an obviously Freudian Hamlet, though none of the reviewers, not even somebody as good as James Agee, who wrote the best reviews of the film and a cover piece in Time magazine picked up on the, how obvious the Freud was um, in the film. Okay, Branagh comes along 50 years later, almost on the dot. The Soviet Union has crumbled. Eastern Europe uh, are over overthrowing its little tin pot dictators, and he's going to give us the whole text. He's going to give us every word. Olivier's film comes in at 2 hours and 20 minutes. Branagh's is 4 hours the longest film since Joseph Mankiewicz's Cleopatra. And of course, that killed it at the box office. Can't do a four-hour film. But anyway, he did. Oh, and one of the great, oh, excuse me for getting into all this. I just don't, I want you to get all this stuff. <laughs> one of the great cross, once again, cross-fertilizations of popular culture and Shakespeare and Shakespeare and film is that Branagh got the money. I mean, wouldn't anybody be mad to give a kid $18 million to make a four-hour film of Hamlet. You just know that that's a loser. That, you know, just bye-bye the money. But the, a production company had developed called Castle Rock, and the only thing Castle Rock ever did, which made it a fortune, was to do the Jerry Seinfeld show. <laughs> so J Seinfeld underwrites Brano's Hamlet. I mean, not directly, but Castle Rock does. Okay, well, I mean, great, the way in which this stuff shifts around. Anyway, so Brano's film is very different. It's shot in 70 millimeter. It's huge. Not only does it give us Fortinbras, it gives us more Fortinbras than you've ever seen in your life. Because every time he's mentioned, we get a cutaway <laughs> to Fortinbras doing something, OK? So it's, it's a very different sort of uh, a, uh, attack on the play. Olivier takes it inside, takes it into the family romance, into the Freudian family romance, into the relationship between, densely into the relationship between Gertrude and Hamlet. And Hamlet takes it out. Um, I mean, Branagh takes it out into an epic um, sort of European 19th century novel. I mean, okay, this Tolstoy's War and Peace uh, hovers behind um, uh, Branagh's version. So it, wonderful the way they, um, they talk to one another in that fashion and a way in which you begin to see um, uh, that films are independent Objects just as stage production. You don't go see Shelley's sensational As You Like It and say, well, that wasn't As You Like It. That, well, they, you know, they didn't wear, uh, they weren't dressed in Elizabethan outfits. You know, they, somebody smoked a joint in, um, okay. No, you've got to see the, the whole um, uh, world that her production creates for the play. And that's what a production does and a film does too. Then the point is, does it work? Shelley's does, okay? Not every film does, but does it work? Does it make, does it make a, uh, a good film, okay? And if it makes a good film, sure. It's great. Shakespeare in Love is a good film, all right? You could imagine that story being told by somebody other than Stoppard, and it, maybe it wouldn't work. But that does. And we say, okay, maybe that's the best version of Romeo and Juliet we've got. Anyway. Oh, does that cover, I mean, I was trying to do Hamlet and the two Hamlets and what made them intriguing to me. Um, I could go into uh, more things. One of the things interesting about the two films is uh, how they're shot. Yeah. Everything in Olivier's film is on a crane. Everything in Olivier's film is on the vertical. There are those winding stairs. Oh, Freud again. There are those winding stairs, dark crannies that we dash up and down. We collapse at the top. When we're the father, we collapse on our mother's lap. We abuse Ophelia at the bottom. Okay? Um, Branos is all on the uh, horizontal. 
okay? Uh, and they, uh, 70 millimeter, you got a camera that you can't take a lot of places. He's got his mounted on a special dolly that was built in Italy for the, uh, the cinematographer on the film was the camera operator on uh, David Lean's Lawrence of Arabia. That's how tight we get in looking. David Lean is, is the film model for Brano's uh, Hamlet. Uh, and so it's meant to be brought, it's shot in 70 millimeter. It's meant to be broad, big, wide, huge, epic. Okay? So it's, uh, and thus, the language is all the same, although you get more of it in Brana, you get all of it, and you don't get all of it in Olivier, but that doesn't. Olivier is still making something very tight, very interesting, as many productions do. I don't, I've only seen one or two or three maybe full text Hamlets in my life. Everyone is cut, and then you look to see not, well, they cut that. Why did they cut it? What did they keep? And why did they keep it? And then did they make that work? Yeah. And something that you're focused, that you're going towards, that I would love you to talk to people more about is the, um, the translating verbal images into visual ones and using the, the grammar and rhetoric of film. And already you're talking just in terms of he, Branagh shot wide for a reason. And Lawrence Olivier did close-ups for a reason, and so more about um, the kind of choices they made with their shooting and editing and lighting and sound. Yeah, um, these are all a part of the language uh, of film. Uh, the, the kinds of shots, the um, the long shot, the close-up, the medium, close to two shot, the reaction shot, etc. And it's nice when you're thinking about a film or talking about it, even in class to have some of that language available so that it's just there and you don't have to uh, make up other language to surround it as though there isn't a quasi, it isn't technical in some uh, way that is unfamiliar to us, um, but we just aren't used to using it in literature classes. But you, you pretty much have to, have to uh, do that. And then you begin to discover, okay, how does a, a filmmaker work? Now, Olivier's um, made an interesting discovery. For him, he discovered that, that the language of film tended to start long and move in. That you got an establishing shot, and then as things got more emotional in a scene, as things got tenser, you got closer and closer to the actor. Um, and he found that, for him, didn't work for Shakespeare. Because as you got, in Shakespeare, as you get closer to the emotional moment, it gets bigger. And suddenly you got this camera right on top of this actor who automatically then looks like they're hamming it or that they're, because the, the emotion that they're trying to express is so huge and so powerful as, as is the language, you gotta give them some room. So he, he and his uh, films began by starting in and moving back to let the actor have that, that space to work with. And there's a, a great shot, which most people do not like, including Alex Thompson, the cinematographer, where Branagh pays absolute homage to that in his Hamlet, which is, I don't know if you've seen the film, but it's the how all occasions do inform against me shot when Hamlet in all black is standing um, with a uh, uh, frozen landscape behind him mm. and Fortinbras's army marching to fight for that little piece of Poland that nobody cares about it, really wants, but they're going to fight for it. And he starts in close and moves back, and the score gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, finally we get this little tiny figure throwing his arms out way back here with the camera at a great distance. Although Branagh's actual point there is how, how grand the language is and how ineffective the actor is. That is the person expressing that, that uh, it's another moment where Hamlet can say huge and powerful things, even in, in, a, in, the, in a way of damning himself, uh, and, and, and not act, talk rather than act. So there's just a little um, example from something Olivier discovered. I, uh, later filmmakers didn't necessarily follow that pattern, but it was something that he had to pick up on, and I think partly it was because he had um, he had watched George Cukor's uh, famous Romeo and Juliet uh, with Norma Scherer and Leslie Howard. This was one of the early experiments in sound 
film Shakespeare from 1936 and had seen that it was it failed and of course it failed too because as you closed in on Norma Scherer and Leslie Howard you realized they were in their 40s and this was not exactly wrong but you could get away with that on the stage couldn't get away with it on film and of course then the, the great film that Olivier went on to make was Henry V where he did need he needed to make all those trumpet speeches and he needed to find a way that the camera wasn't right on top of the actor as he was making them, and so that was what he discovered. Um, maybe a couple of other, just and then we can go on and come back to this. Uh, one of the things that we, that we know is a convention in film and not on stage is that there's always a film score. It's not that there isn't a score to the stage. Uh, in fact, you'll get a lot of birds in Shelley's little, little soundtrack and birds and stuff. But anyway, um, there is a soundtrack on stage, but it's not uh, film soundtrack. It's not big and romantic and a lot of violins, and it isn't always under the uh, the language insinuating what you're to think or whether you're to be afraid or whether you're to wonder what's going to come next. But that's uh, and so there's a great argument about film scores in Shakespeare because in Shakespeare the language is so uh, beautiful. Isn't the, it has its own music. It has its own rhythm. And so are you going to put somebody else's rhythm under it? And is that going to chafe at it? But yet it's a part of the way uh, films work. And so to recognize that and see that and to see how somebody as great as William Walton, a uh, great English composer of mid-century, worked to try to make that work in the Henry V film and in the Hamlet film, or a composer who, who I admire just because his style so brilliantly fits Branagh's style is Patrick Doyle. Uh, who writes has written all the film scores for Branagh's films, and um, they both have a sort of uh, uh, an Irish love of song verging on opera. They want the big, they want it, and they're willing to go for it, even if we Shakespeareans are saying, mm, "Are you overdoing it?" He's aware that he's overdoing it, and I think it works best. Um, uh, for audiences who are not used to Shakespeare films and are used to films, and it works maybe less well for those of us who don't want some other music competing with mm -hmm. Shakespeare's. But it's important. Every film director's got to figure out how they're going to use music. And if you, and it's a great thing to suddenly, if you haven't paid any attention, to see how subtly they do use music. They'll maybe begin a speech with nothing and then bring a few bars in, and then maybe retreat, and then wait until uh, the, the ending of a long exchange or whatever to come in uh, stronger. Sometimes they'll go absolutely silent. One of the great moments in Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet is when he just lets those two kids in the swimming pool talk Shakespeare to one another. No Zoom cuts, no MTV stuff, no big sound. He eventually gets to the big sound, but there may be two whole minutes which is a long time in Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, where it's just the two of them. And it's actually a very, it's a great, charming moment in that film. And that leads me to think, uh, to ask you about the, because I was thinking about the, what's really great about this book is when you're reading it, I would follow along and because of the internet, I could almost find every scene you were talking about and compare the Hamlets to each other. And I looked, I really wanted to show you guys to be or not to be done by Olivier and done by Branagh because they're very different. And so I wanted you to speak a little bit about that scene and also the use of soliloquy in uh, film. Okay, yeah, let's start with soliloquy. Soliloquy is a stage convention. So one of the things a filmmaker has to do is think of what's the film equivalent or what could be the film equivalent. So one of the things that film does that would seem absolutely silly on stage, it can, it can use voiceover. So there's one possibility, which once again Olivier uses uh, in some cases, in some cases not, in some cases he moves in and out, but that sense of our overhearing the actor. In the theater, we know we're overhearing Hamlet because he's there on stage and he's talking to himself, but he's also talking to us because we surround him on three sides. He's at what we call in the theater, or we call in the theater, I think they call in the theater, the point of command. He's where every, that actor standing out on that thrust stage is at everybody's point of attention. So the soliloquy also seems natural. In the way in Memaud, it seems phony. 
an actor standing there where the entire audience is out there supposedly talking intimately to us. Doesn't quite work. Well, on film, you've got the same problem. An actor standing on, in the film, um, just talking to whom? Okay. Now, if film wants to break the fourth wall, that's another way. One way is to do voiceover. Another way is to break the fourth wall. Have the actor look right at the camera and acknowledge that we're there. That, it's interesting how rarely film really wants to do that and how rarely it is actually done in Shakespeare film. Another device is the mirror and the, using the mirror. So what you've got is a character looking in the mirror, talking to himself, which seems natural, and we're getting it. We're getting, very interestingly, the, the, the character and the mirror production of the character. And for Hamlet, that, of course, gives us, you know, that it's gangbusters. We've got somebody who's divided in, in more than one ways. And we've got somebody who is in reflection. We've got somebody who is even talked about throughout his play in terms of mirror images. Uh, the mold effect, the mirror effect, whatever it is. But there are three or four prominent mirror images about Hamlet. He's somebody who is trying to rediscover himself and trying to find out who that person, that new person is because he's been pretty much destroyed by the events that preceded the opening of the play and then, and then hit him again um, early on. So anyway, in Olivier's case, the soliloquy is done up uh, the stairs on this platform that has belonged to the father. That's where the ghost appears. And the ghost in Olivier's, uh, in a sort of Freudian way, is commanding and overpowering. And he flattens Hamlet. When Hamlet sees the ghost, he goes down and reaches out. He does the same thing when the ghost reappears in the closet scene. He's uh, gobsmacked. Um, this is the powerful father who won't stay dead. Okay? He's already struggling with the new father, and uh, who's very much alive and married to his mother. And then he's got this other father that he would like to, uh, to bury, that is, to find some way of uh, assimilating his particular masculine identity and power. But you can't do that if the father keeps cropping up and keeps cropping up and telling you what to do, particularly what to do about your mother. Just, God, just think about that. <laughs> OK, not healthy, not positive. So for Olivier, man. That just wipes him out. For, for Branagh, it's because Branagh really wants to be king. That's the one. And then if you put the political stuff in, it makes sense. Uh, I, I think Olivier wants to get square with his mother. I mean, he wants to get rid of Claudius too, but it's getting square. Branagh would really like to be king. Okay. Uh, he's one of the rare Hamlets. Um, there are a lot of powerful Hamlets. Um, but he's one who you can see has the political skill. He's a little Claudius in many ways, as he resembles the actual actor who's playing Claudius. But anyway, in Branos, it's him interrogating himself in the mirror behind which, because it's a two-way mirror, Claudius and Polonius are hidden. over. That's where they're overhearing from. So the camera is giving us Branna and then Branagh in reflection, and then Branagh only in reflection. And when, when Olivier gets his dagger out, a bear bodkin or whatever, it falls out of his hand, Freudian again, tumbles down, <laughs> the, the camera follows as it tumbles down the rock into the sea. Branagh gets his dagger up, and Polonius behind the mirror, whoa, okay? Uh, uh, he's scared. Uh, and Claudius has to sort of shush him. And Hamlet puts that dagger right up at him, at himself, and um, imagining other things, and you see that he is a threat. A threat not only to others, but to himself in interesting ways. So there, there, there are two different ways of dealing with the most famous soliloquy in the play. It's the only one that Olivier gives us all of. And he actually goes back and forth, I think, very effectively there. In, he starts in uh, voiceover. And then when a moment comes to dream, to sleep, hi, there's the rub. He goes into, then he goes back into voiceover. So it's very interesting the way in which he finds a way to talk with himself using the voiceover device. Branagh does all of his soliloquies straight up. That's because he wants to say all of those words on camera. I mean, he loves them. Uh, and this is his chance, and he knows he's only going to get one chance to do this, and he's going to say them all. Olivier cuts cuts the uh, how all occasions do inform me soliloquy, cuts the um, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave, except for the final couplet. 
um, so you, that's part of how he reduces um, the text. Uh, Branagh gives us all of that because he wants to say it. Okay. Now let me just check on oh, oh, we're yeah. doing good. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, I also wanted to talk to you about how they both envisioned, it, it sounds like from what you were writing that Olivier's Hamlet really is, Hamlet's more concerned with his mother and Branagh is more concerned with his father. And I wondered how, how you, if you talk about bringing that into the bigger picture. Sure, uh, and I think we see this when we go to see Hamlet's, that some are sort of mother-centered and some are father-centered. That is, wh where is the um, crisis? Where is the major crisis for the actor and for the way in which the production has been shaped? Is it related to Hamlet's struggle with his father to achieve the uh, revenge that the father has, has um, commanded him to? Or is it on trying to both um, have, punish, and then reclaim, I think, his mother? Um, and that's why one seems more Freudian and one seems more political than the other. And that, that I think, um, it all has to do with the sort of choices the director and the actor are making as they move through the, um, uh, the play. I think it has to do with the choice of Gertrude. So you get a very interesting fact or phenomenon in Olivier's film that the actress playing Gertrude is 27 years old and Olivier who's playing Hamlet is 40. Now that's because he's Olivier and he can, but he didn't want a matron. I mean he wanted a young, healthy, sexy for that moment, Gertrude, because he wanted that, um, that Hamlet fixation with her mm -hmm. to be alive. Whether we picked up on it or not, that is uh, audiences, initial audiences, is something else. And makes Ophelia, although it's a haunting little performance by Gene Simmons at the very beginning of her career, makes Ophelia even, you know, she's 16. Um, uh, uh, you know, she, she's at the very be beginning of all this, doesn't fully comprehend it, uh, compared to, let's say, Kate Winslet, who's a much more modern, uh, I mean, my students, the female, my female students, are always want a strong Ophelia. They don't like Ophelia who gets eaten up, even if it's not her fault, and even if, you know, the abuser is Hamlet, they still want Ophelia to strike back in some way. Okay, <laughs> right. Cause, then they should. And so the fact that Kate Winslet has got that key, I don't know if you know all this, but anyway, has got the key that she's been duping her captors by having stolen the key and keeping it in her mouth one way to overcome the, um, the water torture, the, the, the therapy, the water therapy that they're given, but also that she's an agent, that she acts, that she um, uh, isn't someone who just uh, collapses, that even if she finally does uh, drown, that is a piece of her own agency and not some uh, accident of, of derangement, okay? And so obviously um, contemporary female students react more strongly to that. So the, so the women, the other great woman in the, in the text, I think the only other woman, huh? <laughs> um, uh, plays a part in how you're gonna do this too. In, um, in father-centered uh, performances, uh, that father is um, the key, and we're going to find some way to make him uh, central. For Branagh, it's with a lot of flashbacks. It's with the very actor who plays him, who seems un. I mean, it's Brian Blessed. Blessed happens to be a dear friend of, of Branagh's, was the best man at his wedding with um, uh, uh, Tom, uh, Emma Thompson. Um, but Brian Blessed, you know, is a great big bear of a man. He, he doesn't have a any sophistication in terms of his uh, physical presence. He's, he's a, a terror. Um, and it's sort of interesting that Branagh gets caught between this father who is overwhelming and who he wants to be scary in a way. He, he admits that the scene with the ghost and Hamlet where the earth is erupting and whatever is, didn't work. And he knows it didn't work because he d didn't have the money to do it right, he, as he said, he really wanted to scare people and he didn't scare anybody. Um, uh, but but in, 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 um, 
in uh, Branagh's film, uh, Claudius is just as silky smooth, and he's got the same blonde. Uh, Bran, Bran uh, blessed isn't a blonde. Branagh is, looks a little like uh, Jacoby. Uh, Jacoby is a very smooth operator and a smooth um, Claudius. And so it, it's sort of interesting, the, the sort of sparks that all sets off. Um, I, uh, he did not intend to, but it almost is though the, the Claudius and Gertrude uh, were having an affair, that this wasn't something, and that the affair started a very long time ago, and maybe this kid is not old Hamlet's after all. Um, uh, and the only reason I, I mention that is that John Updike wrote a wonderful novel at the very end of his career called Claudius and Gertrude, which he credits Branagh's film with inspiring. And that film is about the adulterous relationship between, and begin, ends when Shakespeare's play begins, but he, want, he wants to go back into Updike territory, um, which is adultery, and, and he, well, <laughs> that's, and, uh, and use that as a way, of, Hamlet in his, in his novel is a pimply aged kid who they're all, they try to get rid of all the time. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm sure I remember the question. Oh, so uh, that's that's the issue for Hamlet. It's the father and the, the uh, and the scene. Julie Christie's terrific as Gertrude in that film, but the scene with her is not sexually charged in any fashion. There are the, there is a bed there, but they are only on it once. Very uh, there is no sort of turning her over. There's no physical uh, contact as he uh, as. For Branagh's character, it isn't, uh, it isn't expunging this awful uh, vision he's carrying around in his head of Claudius and his mother making love uh, over the nasty sty. And he's got one of the ugliest images you can imagine in an all Shakespeare, um, in the gross sweat of an semen bed, semen means greased, honeying and making love over the nasty sty. God, it's awful. So, I mean, but that's what's in there. And, and, that, and Hamlet has to purge that somehow. And so for Olivier, and then later much more demonstrably Mel Gibson, the way of purging it is through a sort of mock rape of Gertrude and that suddenly they have to pull back from and come to their senses. There's none of that at Branagh's that's much chaster. Okay. Um, there's so many things I want to tell you guys about this book because it's so wonderful, but I want to leave time for questions. So I do want to talk to Dr. Krull about the future of Shakespeare because one fact I saw was that Olivier was the first, uh, Hamlet was the first Shakespeare play to win an Academy Award without any backing from Hollywood, and that for the most part, most of these actors or directors or writers make Hamlet, I mean, make Shakespeare happen with their own money. And we were talking a little bit about the future of Shakespeare, Shakespeare on film. Where is it going to go? Where, who's the audience now? Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> for those of us <laughs> for whom it's our um, living, we'd like more Shakespeare films. Yeah. We? Um, uh, yeah, uh, we got that a little. Um, it's true that Olivier's. Hamlet is the only uh, film to win the Academy Award that didn't have any uh, American money in it at all. No, no Hollywood no American. money. And so that's why it never shows up on the list of when somebody says, what are the best top 10 Academy Award winning films? Can't be, in, can't be included because it was made with no money. Or the American Film Institute doesn't okay. include it. It's unique in that fashion. And the only other Shakespeare film is Shakespeare in Love to win the Academy Award, and that's uh, in that uh, abrupt edge, another part of that abrupt edge of the spin-off film, not all the way into um, uh, the feral cats and Ro whatever Dennis was telling <laughs> me and Romeo. But anyway, uh, it is true. The where does the money come from? Film is the most expensive of all the art forms. Um, poor Orson Welles spent the last... 15 years of his life begging <laughs> uh, and thinking that, you know, the president of France or somebody was suddenly going to come up with money to underwrite a King Lear, and of course it never happened. So these younger directors, um, Branagh among them, have turned to trying to direct other kinds of films that might make money, mm. um, and that's why he makes Thor 
or the Jack Ryan film because he, gets, he, he does the deal with a percentage. So if the film is big, then he's got something in his coffer that he can use as upfront money when he goes to the equivalent of Castle Rock or whatever to try to get funds. But it's very much an independent project. Also, um, the most recent Shakespeare film we have is Josh Whedon's uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Josh did that on his own from the great profits he made from the Avengers, which is the largest grossing film in all time, over a billion bucks uh, worldwide. And nice that what he wants to do is, is go and make a home movie at his, in his backyard of um, Much Ado About Nothing. Blessings to him. Uh, it, it, until we get another Shakespeare film that makes money, um, and that film got an audience, uh, uh, it's going to be harder and harder for filmmakers to get Hollywood backing because it's a commercial business. Uh, and in the 90s, you got lucky when first Brano's Henry V got everybody's attention and said, oh my goodness. Um, and then Zeffirelli's Hamlet came along that he'd been working to try to put together since Romeo and Juliet in 68. And because of those two big stars, it didn't make a lot of money, but it made money, didn't lose money. And then Branagh's Much Ado About Nothing, which Branagh only got to make because he made the Henry V thing. That was the first baby that really returned me. It was a little budget of about $8 million, and it did $25 million worth of the business. Aha! The Weinstein brothers, you know, they'll take a look at something like that. Um, and then Baz came along and did Romeo and Juliet for about $20 million, and it did $125 worldwide. Okay. Suddenly the coffers were open, and a lot of people got to make their Shakespeare films. Uh, um, Pacino says, I never would have gotten to finish whatever Looking for Richard is um, without Brano. He's the one who finally got me the money, not literally, but um, metaphorically. Okay, and we got then, we got a wonderful run of Shakespeare films in the late 90s, that none of which did big box office. And so it's a shame that a film as nice as Julie Tamor's Tempest, which I think is a very interesting and good and nice film, you know, did Zippo. Uh, it had its longest run in Athens. It played three <laughs> weeks in Athens, and it didn't play in any other theater in the country for over two. And uh, it was, you know, didn't make any money. So, I'm not sure. Uh, with the digital revolution, maybe Shakespeare on film will once again go small scale and with small scale people doing it and suddenly somebody will hit on something that, um, that, that can be blown up into a 35 millimeter and go. Um, but right now we're in a little bit of a slough period so it's hard to know absolutely what's next. However, I will give you, I, I have no inside knowledge of this at all, but I will say that unless there is lightning strikes, we'll get a Branagh Macbeth somehow. It's been on his uh, mind for 20 years. He's now doing, he did a stage version last summer in Manchester and they're bringing it to the Armory on Park Avenue this summer to do another run and I'm, that's all looking for backers. It's got to be. And he's got a little money from Thor and I don't think the Jack Ryan thing did big box office. but So I, I'm certain that we will get Branagh's Macbeth. We missed the chance in the 90s when he and Scorsese had linked up and Marty was going to direct and he was going to play it and they were going to do it Wall Street and then the Almereda Hamlet came out and they said, whoops, you know, that idea is dead. I mean, somebody just did it, just did Hamlet on Wall Street or Hamlet in the media world and then it fell apart. I mean, that is their, their uh, excitement about mutually doing the project uh, fell apart and so it will, it will not be a Scorsese directed Macbeth when we get it but I bet we get it. All right, I'm going to ask you one more, and then okay. I'm going to open. You're going to ask because we should give Go to a chance. I know, I was, to yeah, ask it's going to lead into that. Okay, this is <laughs> terrific. So while I'm standing here, though, just one yes. quick note. Um, please bear with us on the questions. We have a large web audience. We webcast these. And for the benefit of the web audience, mm -hmm. when you ask your question, if you could uh, come to the microphone, or I think we have a microphone to pass around. So... Thank you. Okay. I guess I could. I can ask you my question later. Okay. Because oh. it might not be easy to ask simply. Oh, okay. So you want questions. But people, you want people to watch Shakespeare speaking Shakespeare. 
as opposed to adaptations where... Oh, yeah, I'm just more interested in... Uh, that's what I love. The language. I love Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, so I'm more drawn to film versions of Shakespeare that are using Shakespeare. I also think that's where the problem is. I mean, I, I like 10 Things I Hate About You, and I like She's the Man, etc. But that isn't the problem with making a Shakespeare film. The problem with making a Shakespeare film is getting Shakespeare, using yeah. that language and getting it to work on film, okay? Because film language, if you've ever been to a film, you know that, that yes, the story is important, but don't ask any screenwriter about that. I mean, where he or she falls on the pecking order of making a film. And don't, don't go looking for big, rich speeches. Uh, because that is, you look for dialogue, and the quicker the better, and the back and forth the better, and that's fine, that's great. But it isn't, it isn't what Shakespeare's meat is. And so you've got the, the real challenge for the filmmaker is how you use Shakespeare's language and make it zing. Uh, I just, this happens all the time. It happens walking out of theaters. I'm sure it has happened, people walking out of Shelley's As You Like It. When they see a really good production of Shakespeare, they come out and say, you know, she did a really good translation. Or that was, you know, they, uh, they rewrote the script. And, because, and I just got a paper from a kid who said, you know, it was really interesting in Branagh's Much Ado About Nothing when they stuck in a line that Branagh wrote. And I thought, what? I'm going to get a treat here. What line did Branagh write? And, and when Benedict has, they've tricked Benedict into thinking that a, a, um, Beatrice loves him, and Beatrice comes out to, who had, isn't yet in on the deal. I mean, that she's, anyway, and she comes out to invite him in for dinner, and she's as saucy as she ever is, and he wants to bend her meaning any way he can to have a positive that she's really being, a, and so he says, and there's a double meaning in that. And for this kid who's spent his life in English classes where everything's been a double meaning, that, either, that, was, that couldn't have been Shakespeare. That had to be Branagh sticking that uh -huh. little sucker in there. Okay, fine. That's when we want, that's when it is happening. That's when, um, you know, can you get too much of a good thing? And I want you all to know that um, Dr. Carl's referring to Shelley Delaney's oh. production of As You Like It, which is over at the Forum Theater through Saturday evening. And there is also an exhibit on this floor concerning the same production and Shakespeare. So I open the room up to questions and to our web audience. Yeah, uh, well, quickly, I'm just wondering if you have any uh, thoughts about or insight into the way Olivier, Olivier opens his film with that, to me, very strange one sentence summary that m very few people agree. Well, this right. is a story of a man who couldn't make up his mind. Right. Yeah. What, done. what do you think about that? Boom, boom, yeah. boom. Longer <laughs> pause. Pause. Make up his mind. Um, I think he was, once again, a little terrified about going with this thing into this medium and wanting to make, uh, wanting to do something inviting at the beginning that was going to explain it all for you. You know, because he takes those lines out that are Hamlet talking about Claudius, about the, the one, the one, um, defect in our natures. Um, and he's talking about Claudius at the Voisail, getting drunk, celebrating. And, and here, Olivier lifts it to apply to Hamlet, and then doesn't even let it alone by a line that, yes, Olivier wrote. Um, and I think that, I, 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 nothing I've read, Dennis, indicates that that was something that Arthur Rank said after watching uh, you know, the rushes. You've got it, Larry. <laughs> Nobody's going to know what's going on here. They're going to know. They don't know what this is. And you better tell them. Uh, I've not uncovered. This is not um, uncharacteristic, uh, as you know, of such people. Um, it's where the news, the little um, news of the week stuff comes from in Branagh's Love's Life is Lost. Not that, but Harvey Weinstein saying nobody can understand what's going on here. This is you've got to figure out a way of letting people know. And so that was his idea. If you know, uh, we've just done this in class, as Danielle will know. If you all know, uh, Trevor Nunn's nice little film of Twelfth Night begins with a shipwreck that sort of sets the story up and tells you in dumb show. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. That was all uh, after they previewed the movie. And uh, the preview audience said they couldn't figure out 
what the hell was going on, didn't know what this was all this girl washed up on the shore. So he was encouraged to go write something that would, for a film audience, sort of explain visually what the backstory was. So that does happen. I don't, to my knowledge, this didn't happen here. A mistake. Didn't need to. Yeah, that was a weird thing. <laughs> and I'm sure later he would have said that too. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in uh, what you had to say about Stoppard and the film version of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern is so good in so many ways and yet to me it almost has to lose something to some of the best stage versions because it doesn't have that like Godot-esque claustrophobia of having three walls around it. And I wondered if there are other th things in, you know, not spinoffs in real Shakespeare that are just you know, the unsolvable challenges of taking it out of a um, walled room. And also maybe just a little bit about teaching with the spin-off genre, um, you know, in general, like Looking for Richard or Anonymous, stuff like that. Okay. I, I, uh, that's always a problem uh, when something uh, seems to work so perfectly on the stage and seems so written absolutely for the stage that when you open it up, it just doesn't have that, that same, um, as you say, claustrophobia. In the, and I think that's why we don't have a lot of wonderful movies of Samuel Beckett. Um, okay, I'm just, you know, it happens in one space, as, as Peter Brook would say. And it, it's that Shakespeare seems big. I mean, Shakespeare seems inviting to film because he also seems big, and I think it's probably, it's probably true that, the, that while you start thinking the tragedies are, are going to be what work for Shakespeare on film, that in fact, maybe the comedies work best because they're closer to our romantic comedy formula. I mean, they're, mm. they go beyond it, and they, they create it, <laughs> um, and they do more with it. But nevertheless, they are closer to something we're familiar with, that uh, we're not so familiar with, with um, you know, film tragedy as a major uh, genre that we are attracted to. Um, so that, that would be just some of the things that were off the top of my head. In terms of the, uh, the spin-offs, I don't do, I'm much happier when a student comes in and said, have you seen? Yeah. That is when the spin-off is theirs, hmm. not mine. Um, that is, I, I uh, uh, when we were in college, my group, we, um, we had our books. And we wanted them to be our books. We didn't want them to be their books. And I was, one of the odd things about the 60s then when I got here, the kids wanted you to teach their books. I mean, we could have all, you know, taught Siddhartha, uh, you know, for the end of the, and I kept saying, no, those are your books. Don't want, you don't want those in the classroom <laughs> because then they're going to be classroom books and they won't be your books. So there, there's, I, I want my students to have possession of things that are theirs. And I even sometimes will say I don't like something when in fact I do, just so they say he doesn't know, he doesn't get it, you know, okay? Uh, because you ought to have that too. There ought to be some, something that the old man says no to, <laughs> and I'm, I'm too often saying yes. And so I will say, ah, did you like that? Anyway, as my professors would have said that about Wells' Othello. And were they wrong? That is a great movie. I mean, I don't, I'll go to the end. I mean, the greatest Shakespeare movie ever made is Chimes at Midnight. But that's something else. But Othello is a great film. So how you get, okay. So that's, that's what I would do with that. But you're right. Um, there are playwrights that maybe just come here. <laughs> yes, sir. I have like a million questions, but I'll ask you too. One is, <laughs> at the end of Branagh's version, Fortinbras comes in and kills off the entire court. And I'm wondering well, how... Well, Branagh's already taken care of a good man <laughs> yeah. himself. That is Hamlet. Yeah, but has. at the end, he comes and kills off right. the entire... I wonder right. how you feel about that decision. And okay. we contrast the two sets. One is Branagh's uh, set is very, very bright, and it's filled with mirrors. Yeah. And it yeah. seems to be deliberately done in contrast to a lot of Shakespeare play, which is just the dark castle. Okay. Two great questions. He wants that big moment. Um, he says, it's, uh, we're shooting Die Hard... You know, we're making six films at once here, and this is Die Hard. 
He wants that <laughs> big moment because he wants Fort Bass Bross to be coming in in a coup, in a takeover. This is not some polite little deal where Denmark and Norway have always been pals, and so it's okay we trade kings every now and then. This is a military ending to a play that has been dominated by military figures, and he wants that. And, you know, that's why Rufus Sewell is so good, those lowered eyes, mm -hmm. hawk-like, you know, just, he, he got the right actor, I mean, in terms of look for that moment. So he wanted that. What I found very interesting was that um, two years after that film came out, I saw the, there's a great Japanese director called Ninigawa, who's a, who's a wonderful stage director. And uh, he, he was somebody that the West discovered in the 70s, and there were Macbeths and stuff. Anyway, he did a Hamlet, which he brought to the Barbican in London, and ended it the same way, which I thought was an amazing that the, a Japanese stage director would be st stealing, filching something from a film that everybody knew. Now, he had his own twist uh, in that the actors, um, there were two playing levels, and the, on the upper level, you saw actors supposedly in their dressing rooms making up before large mirrors. So you began already with playing with meta theater, theatrical stuff. And it was those mirrors that the Fortinbras people came in and smashed to hell. So they were killing more than the, the state they were getting rid of. This was, um, they were getting rid of theater, too. Now, so maybe that's why he had them stole it from a film, um, picking a bone with film. Um, your second one, yes. Um, uh, one of the lines that I'm proudest of and couldn't repeat in this book, um, and it's a, just a throwaway, um, but it was picked out by everybody who reviewed a, the a book I wrote called Shakespeare at the Cineplex, in which I said that Branagh's Hamlet was film noir with all the lights on. <laughs> Come on. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and you're exactly right. The, the, we think of Hamlet in Olivia, Olivier's terms. He defined that sucker for us. So it's dark corridors, and it's twisting, winding stairs, and it's a lot of fog, and it's a lot of chiaroscuro with the faces caught. And Branham was going to go once again. And he's going to go Versailles. He's going to go the Winter Palace. He's going for another time, another place that... Um, these things can happen in, okay? Uh, and um, and I, I, think it o I think it only happens because we have the father, uh, if this were um, uh, Harold Bloom, we have the father film. And we're getting the anxiety of influence here uh, out, out of Brenna. Uh, and the uh, Brenna Olivier thing is set up to play with that and somebody is gonna write a book on it someday, not me. But they are. I mean, Brandon now has played Olivier, for Christ's sake, uh, yeah. <laughs> in that uh, wonderful little movie about Marilyn. And so the, the, the riches there are sensational, and that will be a piece of it. Yeah. Thank you. Now I can talk about the as you like it. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Doug, is there anything from the web? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> anything from the web audience? Or nothing yet? Okay. Well then, everyone, if you'll please join me in thanking Dr. Sam Crowell and Lorraine Wagner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're a great audience.